Throughout Scripture, God clearly shows that the Jews are his special chosen people. So then, how is it that Gentiles are now able to partake in the inheritance as part of the family of God? Well, today on Truth For Life, Alistair Begg helps us understand this glorious mystery as he continues our study in Ephesians called Grace and Peace. We were reading Habakkuk the other morning at our, past, at our, our team meeting for, for prayer, just briefly reading from it. And, and you might want to read that later on today. It's very brief. And Habakkuk starts out. He says, how long, is the, how long are we going to have to have this going on? Are you going to do something? And then the answer comes back, yes, I am going to do something, and you're not going to like what I'm going to do. You're going to be surprised by the way in which I do it and the people that I used to do it. I'm going to raise up the enemies against you in order to do this. And eventually, by the time Habakkuk gets to the end of it, he says, well, listen, if the whole thing collapses, if the, if the fig tree doesn't blossom, if there's no fruit on the vine, if, if the whole economy hits the ground with a big calamitous crash, he says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will trust in the God of my salvation. Now, you see, that is a dimension of belief and of faith. You see, what does it mean to live to the praise of his glory? It doesn't mean to go off by yourself and climb up a tree and contemplate your navel or start reading the book or start reading the book of Revelation as fast as you can for as long as you can or or sing praise choruses all by yourself, you know, in a ba- in a, in a, in a in a cupboard. No. No, I tell you what it means. It means making your bed. It means finishing your homework. It means completing the sale. It just means that. It's just extraordinarily ordinary. And he says, We who were the first to hope in Christ, who have been redeemed in this way, have been brought into this position to the praise of his glory. He goes on in verse 13 to the second in him, and he says, In in him, now including the Gentiles, in him you also, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation— You see, what Paul is reminding us of and reminding his readers of is the fact that the Gentiles have been admitted into the spiritual property of Israel, that the wonder of God's electing love was was not unique to the Jew, but the Gentiles were also included in God's plan. There's not two separate lines running forward towards the return of Jesus, the Israel line and the church line. No, it's just one line. That's why when Peter writes in in 1 Peter, he is able to take Old Testament language and apply it to his readers who are scattered throughout the then known world and are a mixture of Jew and Gentile. And, And how does he address them? He says, you are a chosen race— a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, or a people for his own possession. So, it ought to change the way we approach to his friends and neighbors. Instead of a kind of smug, top-down thing about our deal, rather we should be going to them saying, isn't it amazing that we got in on your deal? The fact that you don't know you've got such a deal is something that I'd love to talk to you about, but we're in on your deal. You say, I think you lost your mind. No, I, I think you lost your Bible. Galatians chapter, Galatians chapter 3 and uh, verse 11, it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith, okay, or the one who by faith is righteous shall live. But the law, verse 12 of Galatians 3, is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it's written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Here we go. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. Now, what he does is he says, and this hasn't happened in a vacuum— but rather, he describes the process or the pattern. I think pattern is a better word—the pattern 
of grace. How has this come about? Verse 13, in him you also, here we go, when you heard the word of truth. Something happened. Somebody preached to them. Somebody told them about Jesus. What is this word of truth? It is truth as opposed to error. It is reality as opposed to unreality. John's gospel is full of truth, isn't it? You heard this, and this word of truth is the gospel. What is this gospel? Well, it is, as we said last time, not good advice about what you're supposed to do if you'd like to try and make yourself a Christian, but rather good news about what God has done in Jesus so that you might be placed in a right relationship with Him. So it's not good advice, it's good news. And he says, you heard this. You heard this. It's so straightforward that we're in danger of missing it. God speaks, and we listen. God is a speaking God. He sends Jesus, and Jesus stands forward in time, and all of his miraculous works are to reinforce the word that he speaks. The time has come. It's fulfilled. The the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. And people say, well, what do you mean the kingdom of God is near? And Jesus takes up uh, water and turns it into wine. He takes the sea, which is the the picture of of, um, strife and chaos and disorder, and he walks on it, and so on. He's not doing magic shows. He is declaring in a miraculous way the truth that comes from his lips. And so he says, you heard this. You see, in order to become a Christian, you need a preacher. You need somebody to speak to you. It doesn't have to be a preacher like this kind of preacher. But you hear the word of truth. And if you've been thinking about how you might become a Christian— If you're trying to do it minus the word of truth, it is not going to happen, because God has ordained that it is by this means. When Jesus gives instruction to his disciples, he tells them, I don't want you to go out into the world until you receive the Holy Spirit, uh, the Spirit of promise, and then go. They receive the Spirit, and what's the first thing they do? Preach. They preach. Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost, and he preaches a big, long sermon. And as you follow through the Acts of the Apostles, you discover that as the Word of God grows, so the church grows. And when the Word of God doesn't grow, the church doesn't grow. That's why there are lots of churches that are going through the routine, but there's hardly any Bible in them at all. I don't say it in any spirit of judgment. It makes me sad. But there's no Bible. There's no growth. Why not? Because it is when you heard the Word of truth, the gospel— that you then believed. You can't believe without the something in which to believe. When Peter preaches on that day, and he finishes his sermon, it says that they were cut to the heart, and they said, what shall we do? In other words, there was conviction. And he said, repent and believe the good news. And they did. And there was conversion. And they then got together and listened to the apostles' doctrine and to the teaching and to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. There was community. He preached conviction, conversion, community. And when you think about it in relationship to church history, the same is true. You read any part of history and you realize that the period of the Dark Ages was a period where the Bible wasn't taught. There was darkness— The darkness was actually the absence of the light of God's Word shining into the place. There was sacrament. There was sacrament ad nauseum. But the people did not have the Bible. They never heard the Bible. And God lights a flame in the heart of Martin Luther, and Luther becomes a preacher. I say to you, I wonder if you've been listening to the Bible as it has been taught to you or read to you. It's not, again, you see, becoming a Christian is not some kind of funny thing. It involves the use of your brain. It involves your mind. Later on, in chapter 4, speaking about something else, Paul says to them, he says, but that is not the way you learned Christ. You learned Christ. The people come to Parkside Church, they're waiting for an existential experience, something to hit them or jazz them, or zap them, or whatever else it is. And it hasn't happened. It's unlikely. 
unless you sit on a pin or something. I don't know what's going to happen to you. No, but you could learn, couldn't you? You could apply your faculty of thinking, the mind that God has given you as an engineer or as a scientist or as someone who can understand verbs and adjectives, and you learn of Christ. You learn of who He is, of why He has come, of what He has done. You heard the word of truth, the gospel, and then what happened to them? They actually believed it. They believed it. Not just in terms of intellectual assent, well, I believe there is, or I believe there was, but believing into Christ, believing with a kind of sitting-down kind of belief. You see, I can believe that this is suitable for my increasingly large frame, that I have done no investigation of it at all. Therefore, it will be definitely an act of faith now in front of you to take my seat. Well, there we are. It's worked. That's just as well. Some of you are hoping that it wouldn't work, and that I would just be spread eagled all across the platform here. It would be a wonderful morning for you. You say, we've never had a service like it. But you see, I can believe everything about this and never sit down upon it, and you can believe everything about Jesus and never believe into Him. Give up yourself into Him. Trust yourself into Him. Fall into Him. Rely on Him entirely. You heard this message that He is the Savior, and then your hearts were humbled, and you believed in Him. You believed in Him. Paul is clear about this in Romans, again, in what is really a classic passage for those of us who have any idea of it all in Romans 10. He says, How then will they call on Him in whom they have not believed? Well, they won't. And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? See the pattern? There is the proclamation of the word of truth, which is the gospel. There is the hearing of it. And then there's the believing in it. We used to sing, I remember, a closing of services sometimes when I was tiny in Scotland, a song just and it came to mind when I when I was thinking of that verb, call. How can they call on him of whom they have not heard? The idea of calling on him, like blind Bartimaeus, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the hymn writer had that refrain, pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling. Do not pass me by. You see, that's the entry into an experience of the reality of Christ. It's not... Christ does not come to cater to our intellectual arrogance. But he, he does come to deal with our intellectual integrity. There's a difference. You will never believe in Christ from a position of passive objectivity. It is when the Word of God is preached, and it is understood, and it is believed, and it comes across that you will be as they were, thirdly and finally, sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. The work of the Father to plan this, the work of the Son to procure this, the work of the Spirit to apply it. The sealing of the Holy Spirit. He's promised that this would be the case. It's simply a mark of ownership, whether it is the, the signet ring of the king or whether it is a brand on, uh, on, a, on a beast in the field to identify it as belonging to. And he says, And when you heard this truth and you believed— you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. This is not some strange and esoteric post-conversion experience. This is directly tied to what it means to be in Christ. In Romans and in chapter 8, Paul addresses this, and he says, You, however, are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. And anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Anyone who doesn't have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. In other words, there is no spiritual life absence the indwelling power of God by the Holy Spirit. We say, well, what about it? Well, let's go back down the line. You heard, you believed, 
you were sealed. Well, how will I know? Well, you'll have to do Romans 8 on your own. We don't have time. But there are two ways in which it is obvious and immediately apparent. And that is that when you are indwelled by the Spirit of God, revealing that you belong to God, you'll be led by the Spirit of God. You'll be led by the Spirit of God. Where are you going? I don't know. What are you doing with your life? I don't know. What, what, what are your dreams and hopes and long? I, I don't know. The Christian says, well, I'm actually seriously thinking about what, what God has for me, what it means now that I am in Christ to be a mom to my children. In fact, I've been surprised at the thoughts that I've had and the way the Bible has started to impinge upon me in a way that I had never known before. What is happening there? It is the Spirit of God leading, leading you. Further down, he says, and you didn't receive a spirit of slavery so that you would fall into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons so that you would cry, Abba, Father. So when the Spirit of God seals the life of a child of God, there is the leading of God's Spirit, and there is also the praying. There is the communing, if you like. God is no longer uh, the God who didn't care, who lived away up there, as we used to sing in the 60s. But now he's, he's a father to me. And again, my experience of Abba, Father, my Abba fathers are few and far between. And actually, they're not in moments of great bursts of enthusiasm and joy. My Abbas have been when, like, there's no way out of this box, when there is no answer to this prayer, when it appears as though I have deviated so badly from course that there is no possibility of getting back on track. And it is then, you see, that it is Abba. It's Abba. Father-like, he tends and spares us. Well, our feeble frame, he knows. He leads us. Do I slip? Yes. Do I stumble? Yes. Do I deviate? Yes. But the work which his grace begins, he completes. And it's often painful, but it's always purposeful. Don't miss it. And you will notice, and with this we will stop, that the Holy Spirit is actually the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. Well, there's always more to come. Peter says we have uh, an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, and it's kept in heaven for you. Well, there's, there's, there's a portfolio, isn't it? I mean, you ride the, ride the stock market through the month of January. We're almost finished now. Whee! Boom! Boom! Whee! Boom! You know, your great Aunt Mabel promised you a wonderful painting, but before she could get it to you at all, there was some child stood on the glass and smashed it and tore it up, and it's just is worthless. There's no chance of it yielding you any cash at all. It's defiled. It's perished. It's faded. Not this. Not this. I don't know what that'll be like. I can't imagine. But I remember when I came here in the early days, and I've told you this before, I'd never heard the phrase, will call. I didn't know if it was one word or two words, or whatever it really was. I didn't even know what it was. I had no idea what somebody told me when they said, if you go to will call. I said it to myself. I said, will call. I wonder what that means, will call. So I just said it. You know, I went in the place, and I said, I'm supposed to go to will call. <laughs> even now when I say it, it doesn't sound right. But anyway, so you go to will call. What do you do? You go to will call, you say, uh, Alistair Begg. And unless the person's been spoofing you, what they promised you is there. You're going to stand up on that day. You go to will call. Give them your name. The inheritance is being kept for you. Why? Because you're so good? No, because Jesus 
is so good. Why? Because you have perfectly obeyed? No, because Jesus perfectly obeyed. Why? Because you've made atonement for your sins? No, because he made atonement for your sins. You see, this is the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, which, as you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. And as a result of this, it was to, is, is in the purposes of God so that everybody will know how great God is. Starts with God, and it ends with God. And he doesn't share it with anybody. Doesn't share it with good preachers. Doesn't share it with good congregations. One of the great risks for us as a congregation is we talk about ourselves too much. It's always a harrowing thing, but it's a helpful thing when as somebody said to me just yesterday, and so what do you do? I said, well, I'm part of a pastoral team. Oh, really? What, what church is that? Uh, Parkside Church? Blank stare. Never heard of it. Oh, okay, now I feel a little offended. I want to explain. Oh, have you heard of the radio? What radio? Oh, yeah, it's... Uh, it's uh. Have you ever heard of Jesus? That's really the question, isn't it? We can get really good about telling people about Parkside Church and not telling people about Jesus. It's to the praise of his glory that he's done this so that we might make much of him. It's all about Jesus, and it's all to the praise of his glory. You're listening to Truth For Life. Alistair Begg is in a study of Ephesians called Grace and Peace. And in just a minute, we'll hear a closing prayer from Alistair. But before we get to that, I want to remind you of a brand new resource that's available from Alistair's good friend, Sinclair Ferguson. Sinclair has written a five-week devotional titled, To Seek and to Save. He draws from the Gospel of Luke and presents a travelogue of Jesus' encounters with a wide variety of people as Jesus travels to Calvary. These are people who, like us, are asked the same question. Will we respond to Jesus' invitation to take up our cross and follow him? Each day presents a reading, a reflection, even space for you to journal. With Easter right around the corner, this is the perfect time to begin working your way through the book To Seek and to Save. We'll send you a copy today as an expression of our thanks when you give to support the teaching you hear on Truth For Life. As a nonprofit ministry, we depend on God's provision through listeners like you to continue providing clear, relevant Bible teaching without cost being a barrier. Will you join our mission today? Donate online at truthforlife.org slash donate or call 888-588-7884. But be sure to get in touch with us soon. This devotional will only be available through the end of the month. In case you missed it, I'll give you the contact information one more time. Go to truthforlife.org slash donate or call 888-588-7884. Now here's Alistair to close with prayer. Father, thank you for the Bible. Thank you that uh, the more we study it, uh, the more we realize the wonder of it and how much we need to come back again and again and learn Christ. Uh, help us, Lord, especially those who are wondering, who are sitting out here, and they're trying to process all of this stuff. Some of it is like double Dutch to them. And, and I pray, Lord, that you, will, that you will enable them to continue to seek and to knock, and to find. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. I'm Bob Lapine, hoping you'll join us tomorrow as we continue our study through Ephesians chapter 1. Be sure to listen Friday. This daily program features the Bible teaching of Alistair Begg, and it's furnished by Truth For Life. Where the learning is for living.